Well, hey, Dan, thanks for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate it. Uh, always fun to have other goalies on, which is obviously what I have every week, but uh, always fun to have goalie coaches too, because I, I think you guys bring a different uh, perspective, not just to the conversation, but you're always thinking about how, how we could be better. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, and I have to apologize if you hear any banging in the background. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a uh, teammate here and working out my kitchen. Yeah, no worries. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's going on. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've listened to much of the podcast in the past, but I like to uh, talk to goalies of all ages and skill levels, find out about, you know, the background, you know, why you got into the game, why goaltender, but also, you know, what keeps you going? What what uh, motivates you in the game? So wh why don't we start in the beginning? You know, how did you get started with the game of hockey? To be honest, it, it started when I was a young kid and just Saturday nights watching hockey with my dad. And right from probably as early as I can remember, that was like a, a Saturday night tradition. So it, it kind of started with that, uh, watching hockey. Uh, and then being a goalie, it was just something I always, I think I fell in love with the equipment and, and everything like that to start off. And that's kind of how it started, to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's funny the the guys over on in goal, they always say, well, you know, you become a goalie because, you know, your brother or your sister was already playing and they needed a goalie or mom or dad was a goalie. And th those are all true. But then there's always the, I just love the equipment. That's why yep. I had to be goalie. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I know that's what it was, uh, I think, for me, too, is I started watching the game. Now, I was a catcher in baseball, too, so I, I think there was a predisposition to the the equipment, but it was like, yeah, I, I want to be that guy. Yep. <laughs> um, so you, you start out pretty young. Um, what, what was the journey through the, the game of hockey for you? You know, what levels did you wind up playing at? So I I actually started playing hockey late. Um, I, I started playing hockey at the age of seven. Um, <laughs> it's funny that Canadians think the age of seven yeah. is late for well, hockey. The organized <laughs> hockey. Yeah. Organized hockey. Right. Um, so we did, I did that the first year, I actually, I played house league. I was signed up as a player. Um, always wanted to be a goalie. My parents said, you know what, let's just try it the one year and see where it goes. So we, I went to actually the first practice um and we didn't have a goalie so the coach asked out on the ice if uh anybody wanted to be a goalie for our first game uh, next weekend and I quietly put up my hand and didn't tell my parents until uh <laughs> he showed up at the rink the next week with uh league equipment wet waiting there for me and to be honest it, it turned out into uh I ended up playing the rest of the year uh and then our last game of the season my mom like she begged me, she's like, just play out one game so you can say you did it. Um, you know, you got all the equipment, so let's just try it. So I went in the last regular season game. I scored a goal and got two assists. And my mom's like, look, you're, you're natural. Like, you should be playing out. I'm like, it's not for me. So, yeah. And then after that, I, I just, after two years, I went up to AAA, actually. Made quite the jump. Uh, and I played there. My, my whole minor league uh, career, I guess you could call it. Uh, I played in the GTHL with the Vaughn Kings. And then my last two years in OMHA with uh, the Richmond Hill Stars at that time. Uh, and then in my draft year, I actually partially tore my MCL. Ooh. So I was on crutches for eight months. Uh, and then just basically a year of rehab and kind of where it ended up and then that's kind of where the story goes where how my business started is a, a buddy of mine was a a triple a coach and he said you know we, we we pay somebody to be a goalie coach like would you be interested mm -hmm. so i took that job and and that's kind of how my my business started growing so it, it's interesting it works that way because i i think a lot of goalies it's uh once our playing days are over, 
there's usually a teammate or old coach that goes, Hey, uh, you want to work with these guys? Cause I don't know what the heck I'm doing with them. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, you were fortunate enough though, that you were able to, uh, turn it into a a job at least, you know, whereas I think a lot of us, it, it, it was for me, it was the, uh, volunteer goalie coach and Mm -hmm. you know did that for a couple years till my kids were born um so that that's awesome now i i want to step back a little bit though because you said you know that first year mom and dad wanted you to to skate out and um i know that that was the case for me as well and like you during tryouts they were they needed goalies and my arm went up and so i was uh, one of two on the team uh but but our coach uh, he, he rotated us. So I would play mm-hmm. goalie one game, that kid would skate out and then we switched. Yep. Um, as a coach, how important do you think it is for young hockey players to at least play out for, you know, or rotate out, um, uh, to learn the other aspects of the game? I, I honestly think it, it depends on the, on the, on the goalie. Like some of them, they have their hearts set out a, as being a goalie and, they understand the game from that perspective. Uh, Mm -hmm. Some kids, maybe they have that thought of back and forth. They're not sure this is what they want to do. I think in that case, it's more important to kind of see it from both sides, Mm -hmm. uh, understand the game as a whole. Um, So I I think it really depends on on each individual. Yeah, that that makes sense too. And um, I know at the USA hockey level, they're really trying to stress at the younger levels of not letting just one kid play, but the, the rotation so that everybody yeah. does get that um, that taste of goaltending. But at the same time, like you said, there are certain kids, I, I was one of them, where it's like, nope, this is all I want to do. You yeah. know, I'll skate out because you're making me. I'll be okay at it yeah. because I understand the game, but uh, nope, this is... Yeah. This is what I want to do. And after For that sure. first year, that's all I did. Yeah. I, and I was I the same. I was about to say, I don't think I've worn forward skates since, but I did two uh-huh. winters ago. We had a uh, pretty cool ice storm that turned our uh, streets into ice rinks. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, w- I wasn't about to ruin my blades. <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> so I had sure. an old pair of forward skates in the garage. I threw them on and skated down the street. Oh. <laughs> awesome. That, that Actually, can you hold on just one sec? Sorry. Yeah. I got to take some. One sec. Yeah.
sorry about that. Hey, no worries. It happens. <laughs> I, I, I'm, we're here starting to deal with our uh, AAA tryouts here. So I have coaches calling me and then I have uh, my stepson's missed has missed something for his uh, hitting clinic and I'm trying to deal with that. It's, it's nuts. My phone goes off a hundred times a day. <laughs> I get that. I get that. It's uh it's a busy time for sure for uh, goalie coaches as we get into that pre tryout season, as well as uh, getting ramped up for some tryouts. And yep. you mentioned your son for hitting, is that for baseball or no, no, that's uh sort of body checking clinic. Oh, uh, so here, what for their, well, it'll be U14, U15. Last year, because of COVID, we didn't really have a year, so they mm -hmm. didn't participate in contact. Yeah. Um, so they have to take a hitting clinic before they can go to any tryouts that involve body checking. Oh, cool. So they're supposed to do a Zoom call first, and then they have an on-ice hitting clinic. So apparently he's missed his Zoom call, which was supposed <laughs> to be yesterday. And yeah, so it's been been a whirlwind trying to figure it out because tryouts this year have been condensed because of the timelines mm -hmm. so it's a it's yeah you know it's, it's been one it's, of those days <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned the hitting and you know the ages that the kids are starting to hit I, I remember when I played it was uh the peewee level that we were able to start hitting in games but mm -hmm. they started teaching us how to hit as squirts and yep they started pushing it back and uh, this is just a goalie speaking, but I, I think that's silly that they pushed it back because the sheer physics of kids are a lot more resilient at those younger ages, but they're also not as big. So if they don't quite come into a check properly, the right. odds of them really hurting somebody are a lot lower than when we have these 14 year olds where, I mean, the little league world series just got over and every year there's that, you know, picture of two kids standing at first base one of them's like six feet tall and the other hasn't hit his growth spurt yet and he's like four and foot that's nine exactly what i was gonna say yeah it, it, it's the height and weight differential the size yeah. differential like when you're younger yeah you might have that one kid who's a little bigger mm -hmm. but you know for us like technically for his age it's 15 year old well yeah. you know we have kids that are over six two six three already mm -hmm. Like, yep. and there's kids that are a hundred pounds soaking wet. So it, it'll be definitely interesting on, on how that affects some kids for sure. Yeah. And every time they push hitting back, I just shake my head and I, I would not be surprised if, you know, because they've pushed it back a couple of times, um, you know, that, that we've lost some pretty good kids that really love the game of hockey, but they were just the small kid. And they're like, I, I don't want to get smoked out there. Right. Um, whereas if they were hitting at the PUE level, uh, they'd be used to it. And th they, they would have to the, it. Yeah. They'd also have the confidence that the kid coming after them knows how to hit too. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, but then again, when we were coming up in the game, you know, Don Cherry's Rock'em Sock'em Hockey was coming out every year and we just yep. love those big hits and we wanted to replicate them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're, they're not getting that uh, these days at the end of the season. Those videos aren't coming out anymore and they're, yeah. you know, they're trying to clean up the game in terms of those just vicious hits and, uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I watch the, the old hits and I remember as a kid, like, Oh, that's awesome. And now I'm watching it going, Oh, that makes my head hurt. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's like, I, I personally don't agree with them moving it. I, I agree. It should have been earlier mm -hmm. um, and stay that way, but that's for powers above me. Right. Right. Exactly. It's, it's above our pay grade and we're just goalies. So they're not going to listen to us anyway, because they say, well, nobody touches you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you get into coaching fairly early, right after your playing days. Um, what kind of struggles did you have early on, you know, going from that player role to that coaching role um, with, with people that probably weren't much younger than you? Yeah. So I, I think I was probably about 19 when I, I really started getting into the coaching. Um, so my first team was 
for 10 and 11 year olds. Mm -hmm. So there was, there, there was still some, some difference in age. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest struggle I would say I had was, is learning how to coach different mindsets or different styles of, of, of learning, mm -hmm. you know, goal, teaching goal to me, like, I love it. Goaltending changes from year to year. Yep. Um, so it's learning how to adapt. The hardest part I find for, for coaching is teaching each student or each goalie something that's comfortable for them, mm -hmm. uh, play wise, style wise, but also their, their learning style. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a visual learner and i to be honest, I find that close to, I would say 80 to 90% of goalies I train are visual learners, mm -hmm. but then you also have, you know, kids that you can just talk to them and they understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think my biggest thing was learning how to instruct different learning styles uh, versus any of the, you know, the techniques or anything like that. It, it was just, how can I make each one of my students better in a way that they will re receive the information the easiest? So I think that's kind of where, where my struggles were at, at first. It's interesting you say that because I remember when I was coaching, you know, we had different goalies, you know, different personalities. In fact, the whole team is different personalities. And the other coaches just kind of brought this coach them all the same way mentality and treat them all the same way. And uh, when it came to the goalies, I, I treated them each differently based on that personality. You know, there was the one goalie where I would just look at him and be like, Nate, get your head out of your backside. You know, what, what, what's going on? He's like, yeah, I know. And then there was the other kid where I had to put my arm around him and be like, Hey, but it's okay. You know, don't worry about it. And it, it was just learning those personality types and understanding, you know, who they were as people that, that was difficult. And, you know, when, when we had new kids come into the program, it, it took some feeling, you know, trying different things to see what worked for them and what didn't. Yep. And um, it's, I remember we had this one goalie, he was uh, problematic personality wise. And the one day I just asked him, you know, what's going on at home Then found out, you know, he had some issues going on at home with his, you know, biological dad and this and that. And it was like, okay, so you're acting out not because you're not getting the game or not playing well or anything like that. You're acting out because you got other stuff going on. Yeah. And it, it, the fact that I just asked how he was doing, what was going on, kind of changed the way he listened mm -hmm. to me. He wouldn't listen to the other coaches, but when I looked at him, I could be a little bit harder on him because it was just asking those little things, finding out about who they were, not just what did they do. Absolutely. Uh, I, I find like with any goalie I instruct, it's, it's getting them to trust you. And it's not even just at a, a level of trying to teach a technique. It's, you know, you're building a relationship with that, with that student. So if, if they're seeing that, you know, you're taking the time to work with them and they, you want to know about them and how they want to play versus, you know, just kind of saying, this is what you have to do. You're showing them the options. You're, you're showing them that you want to help them improve. And I find once a student realizes that you're on their side, you're there to help them to improve their game as soon as they trust you they're an open book they they're ready to learn they they take anything that you say 100 percent seriously versus somebody that you know is just thrown at them and is forcing them to do something that's kind of where you get the pushback right so mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting you say because I, I can't remember which goalie coach it was but i remember he was showing one goalie something that he wasn't showing me. And I kind of asked him, I was like, why aren't we working on that? And he, he looked at me, he goes, cause it doesn't fit your game. Yep. And he said, my job isn't to get you guys all to play the same way. My job is to look at the way you play and make you better from that. And I was like, exactly. Huh. <laughs> you know, I remember being a young kid, I think it was maybe in high school and it was just kind of like, huh. 
never thought of it that way, but it, it made yep. a lot of sense to me. So you've been in this coaching game for a little bit of time. Yep. Uh, and it, it's crazy when you, you start looking back, you know, not that long ago, how much the position has changed, as you mentioned, from year to year, it changes. What do you think has been the biggest change in the game since you started coaching? Oof, it's been a lot. <laughs> um, well, you're, you're, you can go back to something, even the equipment size has changed, mm -hmm. something like that, versus, you know, when the butterfly first, you know, was starting to be introduced. Uh, to where we are today, where it's, you know, you're, you're kind of seeing that athleticism come back into the game. Mm -hmm. um, something I've been noticing in the last year or two with NHL goalies even is like, you're seeing more movement on their feet mm -hmm. versus those long slides that it, it was previously. Um, so like I said, it's always adapting. Like you go back, you know, prior to, Hold on one sec. I'm getting another phone call. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry about that. I apologize again. Hey, oh it, it happens. Like you said, it's busy season. Yeah. Um, you know, as you were saying, so much has changed in the equipment. You know, things were so much bigger. You know, I, I yep. think back to uh, Garth Snow and, uh, you know, his giant floaters. Um, yeah. Some even like Jaguar. Yep. I yep. was just going to say Jaguar and, you know, his huge. Yeah, he had the big chest protector, but I, I remember his pads being so huge. Yep. But then you look at a guy like Marty Brodeur, who even at the end of his career, when he was standing up, you could still see his hockey pants. Yep. Um, you know, he, he didn't really have the thigh rise that uh, most goalies do today. And, um, you know, I, I heard stories that he, he had the old school chest protector. Um, you to know, the where, day he retired. Yeah, to the day he retired where, he, yeah, you're getting those bruises on the belly, but uh, – you felt it. Uh, yep. I can't remember if it, who, who it was I was having the conversation with, if it was Ron Tugner or Kelly Rudy. And we we're talking about there was just something about um, that equipment from the 80s and the 90s where, yeah, the puck hurt. You got those bruises, but it also probably made us better goalies because we realized, hey, if I don't get my hands over here, I'm going to feel that puck and I'm going to get a bruise. Yeah. It's not going to be fun, but if I get my hand over here and catch the puck or I get my blocker in the way or whatever, 
it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it, it promoted the, that athleticism. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, kids today, it doesn't seem like that they have the bruises like we used to. I remember I met Steve oh, no. Larmer at a uh, autograph signing as a kid. And, you know, my teammate's like, yeah, this is Joe, our goalie. And he goes, prove it. Where are the bruises? And I just, you know, lifted up one, you know, sweatpant leg and showed all the bruises were on my knees. And he goes, yep, you're the goalie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think kids are um, definitely it's a good thing and a bad thing, in my opinion, you know, it's good that they're protected. Yep. But um, I worked in the commercial playground industry for a while. And there was a great article about, you know, have we made things too safe for kids to where they don't, um, they don't know how, what their risks really are. So they, they're getting hurt because they're trying things they shouldn't because they, they don't have that built in. Wait a minute. I, I've Let's pushed, think about this. Yeah. And it's, I almost wonder if it's the same thing in goaltending where they're doing things because they're not going to feel it. Who Mm -hmm. who cares? Um, I've thought about that quite a bit. I could see that for sure. And Um, and like you brought up, like when they do get hit with a puck and it does hurt, it's like, well, this hasn't happened before versus uh, that happened every practice multiple times, you know, like I, I, I remember getting dinged in practice plenty of times. Now it's like a goalie gets dinged in practice and they got to leave practice. They're done. Like it, like you said, it, it kind of gives that toughness as well. Like, mm-hmm. what are you going to do in a game? Big game. You get hit in the knee, you're going to get carried off and, and kind of throw your partner in for the loop. Right. Or are you going to battle through it? Yeah. I, I remember when they were, uh, making the goalie equipment smaller in the chest protectors and goalies weren't happy because they, they were, you know, feeling it in their arms and a little bit in their belly. And I forget which retired NHL goalie was that said, boo hoo, that that's yeah. what it used to be. If you don't like it, stop it with your gloves. Yep. <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah, stop, stop whining that you have a bruise that, that comes with the position. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, when I was in high school, I, I was having issues with my hands. And so ice was ready early. And my, my coach took me out there and he was going to shoot at me. And he, then he goes, put your helmet on the net. And I just kind of looked at him and go, what? And he goes, put your helmet on the net. And I still kind of looked at him and goes, listen, if you don't have your helmet on. Your hands are, you're going to be much more concentrated and you're going to stop sure. that puck. Yeah. And I went, okay. And he started with the puck blow. I'll, I'll give him that. But yeah. Yeah, he was right. Uh, I wanted to protect my face. So anything that came near, I caught it or knocked it out of the way with my blocker. And my, my teammates were just standing behind the glass like, these guys are nuts. Yep. <laughs> but I do remember after practice, one of my teammates goes, Joe, if you were playing back in the days when goalies didn't wear masks, what would you have done? And I said, I would have been a forward, plain and simple. Yep. <laughs> like, <laughs> this it would have changed good. your outlook on it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it was just funny. He's like, oh, okay, okay. That's a good, good answer to that one. Um, if we're talking equipment, you know, what do you think has been the best, the best change for equipment, uh, since the days, you know, you and I were young and playing competitively. I think overall the weight of the equipment has changed. Uh, mm-hmm. this past week, I just, at my camp, uh, we demoed all the new uh, Bauer Hyperlite uh, equipment, and mm-hmm. it's a, it's it's crazy how light the stuff has gotten. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I would have to probably say the mask. You know, comparing what I used to wear versus the mask I wear now, it, it's night and day. Not only the weight, but like the construction, um, stuff like that. I would have to probably say the mask for sure. Yeah, it's funny you say that because the mask has looked the same since the 80s, with the exception of the armadillo, which I have the uh, story of that in the latest vintage Tendi magazine. He lives in Kitchener down the street. Yeah, I've had Don on the uh, show before, and he's a fantastic guy. And I I love how he brought in, you know, the completely different uh, insight of auto racing to make it completely different mask. And the thing is, since Don, nobody has done anything else different. They all have that same, you know, chubberly um, look to, to their masks. 
but the construction and the materials and you know everything that's inside the mass has completely changed. Uh, you know the the look has stayed the same, but the, the protection is night and day. Yeah. Um, in fact, that is one of the few pieces of equipment I have updated uh, in the past few years. And one of the things I liked about the Bauer mask is it had 3M vibration reduction tapes inside between layers. And I think mostly it would be like tape, okay, whatever. At the time though, I was working at 3M on okay. their automotive team, uh, their automotive electrification team. So we were talking about these tapes an awful lot. And I understood like how they absorbed that shock and disperse mm -hmm. it. Because what they're doing is they're using that tape for your, your electronic systems in your car. And they need to stay, you know, pretty smooth as you drive down the road, even if you're driving down a dirt road. So it's like, they may be thin, but they, they do an awful lot. And I'm like, okay, that, that's pretty cool. And that, that was one of the deciding factors when I bought that mask was uh, that technology in them. And of course, a couple other things, but it was like, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It, it's not just a few layers of fiberglass anymore yeah. in a, uh, you know, cage that's going to rust in about two years. Yeah. A lot of like, a lot of them are full carbon too now. Right. Mm -hmm. So yep. it helps with the, the weight as well. So, yeah, it, it's talking about the weight of the equipment. Um, I don't know if you, you've noticed on Instagram, but I I'm wearing some pretty old equipment myself. I bought it in 1999 and, to me, that's just normal, the, the heavy mm -hmm. stuff. But I, I've got a uh, order in Devon uh, nine weeks ago for some new stuff. And I'm just sitting here going, it's going to be so nice to have light stuff. Uh, I'm not going to have seven buckles on every pad. <laughs> to, yep. I, I can get out of the locker room, you know, maybe 20 minutes quicker. Uh, but, but that weight. Uh, and it's funny because I think most goalies will go, oh, yeah, the weight during the game's the issue. And for me, it's like, no. The weight in the hockey bag after the game. <laughs> uh, I, I I refuse to have a hockey bag with wheels. I say I'm the same. The day I need a hockey bag with wheels is the day I need to retire. Um, same speech I gave my girlfriend. She's like, yeah. "Why don't you just get a wheel bag?" I'm like, "Not happening." But after after a game, sometimes I'm looking at it going, "A wheel bag would be nice right now," <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. The funny thing, my uh, old bag was starting to go. The zipper was falling apart. So two years ago for. I think it was Father's Day. And my kids wanted to get me a new bag. And I was like, you know, I thought it was pretty cool that they did that. And so my wife takes them to the uh, pro shop and she goes, you know, we need a goalie bag. She, you know, she doesn't go into pro shops often. So she's like, we need a goalie bag. And their first question is, well, does he put his pads in inside the bag or not? And luckily both my kids have come to a few of my games and they're like, he, he puts them in the bag. I'm like, okay, <laughs> does he need a roller bag or not and my wife was but you know according to my kids goes well he is getting older and my daughter goes no mom dad says he hates those bags and they're ridiculous and if you can't carry your bag you shouldn't be playing yeah <laughs> so they they bought me one without without wheels and it's uh it's a good bag it's held up so nice. far <laughs> yeah uh, to be honest it's probably one of the only things i haven't replaced i still have my my midget triple a bag that's still kicking around yeah well i have my old high school bag and i could use that but my pads don't fit in there uh so that that's where all the uh, pond hockey equipment goes yep um and my kids use that one but i, I had my bag from college and i had that thing 20 years and the zipper was just falling apart where it was like yeah. why even zip it up because the seam is opened up anyway and so yeah I, I was going to take it to uh, Georgie's Hockey Repair here in town, but then they got me a new bag. And I went, okay, no need to spend yep. a few bucks and get that repaired. So, yeah. So one of the questions I always like to ask people too is, um, when you're not playing hockey, what, what fulfills you? What you know kind of grounds you and keeps you uh, sane away from the game? Away from the game, it, for me, it's golf, uh, especially – if I'm not working, I'm not on the ice. That's usually where I try to be is on the golf course. Uh, one, I, I'm a competitive person, so it allows <laughs> me still to have that competitive juices with myself, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, having a good time with friends. And it, it, it just distracts me for that four or five hours 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it keeps my head away from the game. So, yeah, I, I'm not much of a golfer. I can count the number of times I've golfed, uh, but what I enjoy about it is the people I golf with. Yeah, uh, I the people that will go to the you know course by themselves and do a run by themselves. I'm going. Well, that was a waste of four or five hours. <laughs> you know, yep. if, if you go with some buddies, it, it's uh, much more enjoyable, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, and if the beverage cart's coming around frequently, it's even better. Absolutely. Especially after a bad hole. Yeah. I, <laughs> there, there was a job I was working a couple of years ago, and they took everybody golfing. Uh, we actually went on a family corporate retreat to this nice little lodge up in uh, northern minnesota and they had a really nice golf course so we had nine o'clock tea time everybody in the group i was with we get to the second hole and the beverage cart comes up and they're like what, what are you gonna have and we're like i don't know you got any orange juice and she's like yeah we're like ah, we'll take three orange juices and she goes now before you give the final order just know that everything's paid for for the round when they're like screwdriver screwdriver three screwdrivers yeah. all around and she came by every other hole. So by the time we got done, we weren't looking at our golf scores. We'll just put it no. that way. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a uh, it was a fun round of golf. Uh, yep. At one point, I, I hit the ball. It hit a tree and wound up 25 feet behind me. And one of the guys goes, well, that's something I haven't seen on the golf course before. Happened, three more, happened three more times before we were done. And <laughs> By the third time, he's like, that's enough. It's not funny anymore. I was like, I'm yeah. not even trying to do it. <laughs> that's just how bad of a golfer I am. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a fun game when you're with the right people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, as kids get ready to, you know, start this uh, fun tryout process, what do you think is the most important thing they should be focusing on going into this new season, going into the tryouts? Uh, you know, what, what can they be doing to get themselves ready? Well, like for, for kids I train, it's, I have kind of noticed there's kind of two groups right now. There's the group that have been skating as much as they can mm -hmm. versus you know kids or or goalies that have been away from the rink for a while mm -hmm. um it, it, it is that period where everyone's now rushing to get as much ice as possible get back into the swing of things um around like last year here anyways uh it was a, a difficult season especially for goalies uh, mm -hmm. we didn't we weren't able to play any games so it was just practice 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 until everything got shut down so the goalies kind of found that, you know, in, in practices, it, it was more of a, just, they were a target more than anything. Right. Yep. So they weren't able to really get that competitive feeling of playing a game uh, throughout the year. So to be honest, what, what I preach to them is, you know, get that competitive feeling back, get that gameplay mentality back and be and be ready for it whether it's you know I, i've told some of my students go back and watch some of your old games that you have taped what how does that make you feel like you do you feel like excited to get back out there and feel that again mm -hmm. uh and and all of them have said yes so for me it's you know it's the typical you know go out there and if you're trying to make a team that is moving up a level you just want to prove to the evaluators to the coaches like but there's no way that they can cut you, right? If you want to move up and you want to improve on what level you're playing, you have to go out with that mentality. But I, I honestly think that the biggest thing, especially for, for goalies around here, is get that competitive game feeling back. You know, if you're in drills, pretend it's a game. Mm -hmm. Like, ever as a goalie, and I'm sure you feel it too, like, you feel different when you're out doing a training session versus in a game. Yep. So if you can emulate that feeling of playing a game in your tryouts, I personally think it, it, it brings you to that next level. Right. So for me, it, it, it's just preaching, you know, get that competitive feeling back, that feeling of, you know, you're starting an important game and, and, and treat your tryouts as if it's, 
it's that championship game that you you're looking forward to. Yeah. It, you know, for me, I, I was always competitive. So when we were yep. in practice, it was like, okay, there's a certain players where I just, I got to stop them. Cause I, mm -hmm. I know they, they're just the snipers. I got to stop them. Or if we were doing two on O's, it was like, all right, out of the next 10, I want to stop six of them. Um, you know, it's, you, you got to set up those little games within the the practice to, to yep. give you something to shoot for. And I, I've heard even some NHL goalies where they'll go, it's not a 60 minute game to them. They'll, they'll break it down into five minute or two minute increments and say yep. for the next two minutes, I'm not letting anything in or for the, you know, it's a strategy I use is a period at a time. Each yeah. period's a game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I teach it to a lot of the younger goalies that I train as well. Like, listen, bad goals happen on everybody. It, it, it's the ability to bounce back from it. So mm -hmm. whatever, whatever technique we can use to help you get over that bad goal, to get you back in that mentality of, I need to stop the next puck or the puck after and to keep your team in it, you know, it, it, it's... I think it's beneficial for them and it, it's it's training yourself to kind of like you said that competitive nature mm -hmm. like I, i'm like you i've i've always been competitive whether it's with myself or with a goalie partner or even against teammates for fun in practice like i wanted to stop them mm -hmm. so you know like you have those little games with even with guys on your team that you know are your top players like you said like even just being competitive one-on-one -on -one with them it's I find that fun I always have uh even when I play now like we play there's a group of us so we play uh once a week and it's the same guys and mm -hmm. still at, at our age still pretty high quality hockey it's the same thing it's like okay I know this guy's gonna do this move or I I know he's he's that scorer right so I do whatever I can to be prepared to Kind of compete with him one on one type thing. Yep, I remember when I was in college, we had three goalies, and um, whenever I was on the same end with the one kid, like we were competitive with each other, but in a good yep. way. And a it was friendly like, competition, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it was like, all right, for the next ten, we're gonna count how many go in, and then when I come in, I'm gonna try and do better. And but the thing is, like, we were cheering each other on, like you got to make this next one to win it, you know. Yeah. Um, well, and it, it probably made you both better too in the end. Oh yeah, absolutely. It did. And, um, you know, you, you talk about the competitive side, I might be overly competitive at times because my family won't play Monopoly with me anymore because of that. <laughs> uh, they, they call me old man Potter from it's a wonderful life. <laughs> so nice. yeah, I, I get a little competitive at times and, uh, but that's all right. At least I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I, I, again, I don't know how many episodes you've listened to, but I like to end every episode with 10, I call them rapid fire questions, but they take longer than a rapid fire should, Okay. Uh, because they tend to bring up some good stories. Uh, okay. So the first one is what's the craziest coaching moment from your playing or coaching days? Craziest coaching moment. Well, I was, when I was still playing, uh, it was kind of that old school coaching mentality still. So I remember having to do a bag skate until somebody puked at center ice in a garbage pail. So I'd say that was probably the craziest coaching moment I've seen because nowadays you, you can't do that anymore, obviously. No. Um, and yeah, it was after just a poor team performance the night before and a game that we should have won easily. We took too lightly and coach sent pretty clear message mm -hmm. um but for me that'd probably be the, the craziest because it's right out of you know you, you see those those movies it, it was exactly like that yeah and i'll be honest we didn't take any game late lightly the rest of the year so my, my uh wife and brother-in-law tell this story when he was playing high school hockey here in minnesota uh they they had an away game and didn't play up to uh the skill they should have so when they got back to their home rink because they took buses to the and all their parents are in the parking lot waiting for them the coach made them unpack their stuff out of the bus put it in the locker room and then had them out in the parking lot running and oh, wow. parents were not happy 
But yep. uh, again, sign of the times. None of them said J- Johnny get in the car. It was okay. We're going to let our kid run until the coach lets him yep. go. Even though we're not happy that we're sitting here waiting for him in the middle of you know Minnesota winter. But it's like, no, you guys didn't play well. You're you're going to run. Well, and and that was the thing. Like, you know, we accepted it. Mm-hmm. We knew what it was from. It, you know, and it was you win as a team, you lose as a team. Yeah, we we did the skate as a team and i truthfully think it brought us closer together in in the long run yeah well Well. there's a little bit of that herb brooks mentality where it's like okay it yep bonded you guys to not like the coach you guys had a common enemy (laughs) yeah and (laughs) and to be honest like at first yeah everyone's pretty ticked off at the coach and was like well why are we doing this and but by the end of it it was it, it was a a lesson to us all like you know he expects a certain level of performance from us and like truthfully i i i think as a whole we respected him more at the end of the year because of it Mm -hmm. because he held us accountable for our actions right right so uh, it like you said what's the craziest is probably pretty crazy if you look at it during these times but for us i think it was what we kind of needed yeah, I mean, did you grow up playing hockey in those times if you didn't have at least one bag skate where somebody had to puke? <laughs> you know? It's true. Yeah. It was, I, I think a lot of us our age have at least one of those stories. Yep. Um, there, there were a couple times where I thought I was going to, and I think if the coach would have told us we were skating until somebody puked, somebody probably would have been like, okay, I, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can go. I can beat that guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's is funny. Uh, so the next question is, what's your favorite all-time goalie mask? Goalie mask. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, it, it honestly, just like iconically, I my favorite goalie was Martin Brodeur. So something mm-hmm. like a Brodeur mask or even uh, Curtis Joseph growing up in Toronto. So those two would probably be those up there for sure. Yeah, you know. Marty Berger was one of those goalies as he played. I always thought he in the younger days was overrated. And then as he kept playing and kept dominating in different eras, I was like, okay, yep. Cause I, you know, when he first came on the scene, we, we had Patrick Watt, we had Eddie Belfort, we had yep. Dominic Hoshik and Curtis Joseph. And so to me at the time, Marty Berger was just another elite goaltender, but I didn't think he was one of the best at the time. Yep. And then all these other guys wind up retiring and Broder's still dominating. Uh, and yep. eventually it was like, okay, yeah. And I kind of have the same feeling, but Mark Andre Fleury, where at the beginning it was like, okay, he's good, but you know, drafted at first overall. Yeah. And now he's still playing in quite a different, you know, game than when he was drafted and he's still dominating winning yep. Vesna trophies. And, uh, as a Blackhawks fan, I'm excited to, uh, see what he does in Chicago this year. I For think sure. he's got a chip on his shoulder after the way he was treated in Vegas. And he's, yep. he's good. Well, and he kind of had that chip when he first went to Vegas too. Mm-hmm. And he, he took his game to a different level when he first started with Vegas too. Yep. I, I can't say he'll play angry because he's always got a smile on his face, always. but he, yep. he's, <laughs> he's going to be playing with an attitude. That's for sure. Absolutely. Uh, um, and I, I'm also, he's got some style, so I'm excited to see what he does with <laughs> his pads and his mask there, but his mask painter is the same guy that painted Crawford. So yep. I, I wonder if there'll be Could something be similar. similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm excited to see what he does there. That's for sure. Um, so the, the, the next question is one that uh, tends to bring up some good stories. What's your favorite rink that you've played at? Ooh, favorite rink. I would have to say I was able to play at the Air Canada Center, so which is now the Scotiabank Arena for mm-hmm. the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I, when I was younger, we went to the finals of a tournament um, and got the full like NHL treatment. Oh, cool. uh, so you got your your full 20 minute warm up, And the one thing I remember the, the most about that arena was how hot it was on the ice. Yes. You know, like you play in all the rinks, even like nice ones, like OHL rinks around here. And it still feels like a rink. It, it's cooler. You know, mm-hmm. it has that atmosphere. Um, stepping on there, it, it honestly felt like a sauna. 
those TV lights are something else. I was fortunate enough to play at uh, what's now the All State Arena where the Chicago Wolves play. And that was mm-hmm. the first thing I noticed too, is like, I was playing the second half of that game and I'm sitting here on the bench sweating. I'm like, Jesus, this is ridiculous. <laughs> well, we stepped out just for warm up, mm-hmm. and like, you just start sweating it, yeah. and it's like, okay, you get off after the warm up, and you feel like you're cooling down in the dressing room. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, it, it, like I said, it was completely different. And yep. one thing that, another thing that I felt found weird was tracking a puck around the glass in an empty rink like that yeah it was tough yeah definitely tough you know you mentioned the 20 minute warm-up and I didn't have a 20 minute warm-up until college and I'm the kind of goalie I I like to get my feel for the puck and then kind of I'm not one of those goalies when I started where I wanted every single shot of warm-ups because I I always Mm -hmm. And today, I still feel I only have so many saves in me for the day. I don't want to use them all in warm ups. And <laughs> when we had that 20 minute warm up, it's like, oh, Christ, I'm going to need another warm up by the time the Zamboni is done because this is taking so long. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I, I still remember the high school I went to, I was averaging, you know, 40 plus shots a game my senior year. And, you know, the young freshman, sophomore year is probably 60 plus. And we were playing 17 minute periods. And then I get to college and we're playing three 20 minute periods and I had a defense in front of me. So I'm getting maybe 20 shots a game. So after my first start, one of the upperclassmen comes up and he goes, you know, what, what did you think of the game? And I said, Oh, it was nice that we won, but God, was I bored back there. You guys <laughs> gave me nothing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm used to three times as many shots. And he this, just started was my warm up. Yeah, it, it, I was like, and for me, that that almost took more mental strength staying focused because mm-hmm. I, I, I've i had this conversation with other goalies too. Those games where you get a lot of shots, you don't realize how many you got until after the game. Exactly. You're, you're, you're just in getting zone. a rhythm where yep. it's like boom, boom, boom. But those games where the shots are far and few between, it's a lot harder to stay focused and on top yep. of things and keep that feel for the puck for sure um you know that that's something that's uh hard hard to do and especially for us beer leaguers who haven't had many opportunities to to play as much that's for sure so the the next question always throws people for a loop what's your favorite goalie stick that you've ever used goalie save Uh, goalie stick but we can do save next i like that one. goalie stick yeah Uh, uh I would probably have to say the new ones that I'm using now. I I have the I, I'm using the right now, anyways, the Bauer One Supreme One S Pro. Okay. And it it is the best composite stick I've ever used for sure. Mm-hmm. Durability and performance, it, it's by far the best. Um, and I grew up started with foam core like and wood way back Sherwood 50 30s mm-hmm. and then as I got older I got into uh, the 9950 and I used that oh for years but I just found that once composite came out and the the foam core would just get soft too quick mm-hmm. uh, so I went to composite and the early composite I like like I was saying like they had durability issues. Like, yep. I, I would go through, Oh, geez. I think I went through four or five a year, if not more at, at some point. Um, but I'm, I'm really liking what I have now. I think I'm going to dip into some of the newer ones uh, for the upcoming year. So we'll, we'll see how they go, but definitely the one that current one I have right now. You know, when the composite six came out, like you said, they had durability issues and at the price point, I wasn't going to pay that not for the beer yep. leagues. In fact, I'm still using foam core sticks because I'm cheap. Um, but I, I've kind of made the decision. The next stick I get probably will be a composite because yep. I think they've addressed the durability issues. And, they, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, you're going to drop a few bucks for it, but you're going to get some time out of it. Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned it. It's not part of my <laughs> rapid fire questions, but I got to ask now, what's your favorite save? favorite save uh mm-hmm. i've 
you remember Curtis Joseph's sliding stick save against Dallas in the playoffs where he slid yes. too far? I yes. was lucky enough in minor midget to pull off one of those. And oh, cool. it was pure luck. Um, and I, I'll say it, it, you know, a little bit of just battling to, to make sure I got back a bit. But definitely that was the save of all saves that I've made, I would say. <laughs> I think one of the coolest saves I made was actually in a spring league in high school. And I'm off a little too far past the left side of my uh, glove side post and the puck shoots out the other way to my blocker side. Kid's got an open net and he just rifles it about, you know, halfway up the net and I dive across both arms and it, I don't catch it, but it hits me in the glove and goes into the corner. And uh, after the game, one of my teammates, as he's asking me, how did you make that stop? I'm taking my chest protector off and I'm wearing a Superman t-shirt. Perfect. <laughs> so it, it was just like not only the save, but the question after the game and the yeah. fact that I happen to have that t-shirt on. He's like, don't even answer. Don't even yeah. answer. Thanks. I got my answer. <laughs> yeah. It, it was just like perfect timing that that was happening at that point. Uh -huh. um, but the favorite save question dovetails nicely into the next actual question what's your favorite youth hockey memory oh boy honestly i i would have to say just you know probably a typical answer like playing travel youth hockey it's the away tournaments and spending time with with a group of, of your buddies that turn into almost like a family like you know mm -hmm. i remember playing my last couple of years like you're together with them six days a week, if not every day of the week. Yep. Right. So, you know, it's experiencing tournaments with them or, you know, going into a, an away arena and, you know, getting booed at like at the age of 14, 15 and how to react to it. And, you know, just the, I'm still friends with a, a big group of them. And mm -hmm. uh, like, I, I would say it's, it's, you know, those friendships and, and those memories that you make with those guys that you still talk about today when you get together for a round of golf or something like that. Right. So yeah. definitely I would say that would be the best memories for sure. And that, that's a common answer too. And I, I don't think that's unique to hockey either. It seemed, you know, my son's a baseball player and he loves those away. I shouldn't say tournaments we've only really had yep. one because our, our association is really nice on us most of the tournaments even if they say you know it's an away tournament you might want to get a hotel they're still close enough you can come home uh but we had one this yep. year where there was no coming home it was like two hours away so we got that first hotel experience and uh yeah some point i had to tell him was like hey you got a game tomorrow we need to go up to the room and we need to go to yep. bed he's like but dad it's only 10 o'clock is like i get it but you're still here to play a game. And yep. the other dads were kind of doing the same thing with their kids at that point, where it was like, it's reached that time. You got to start thinking about the game again. Doesn't matter that damn near every team from the tournament was at the hotel. And even though the pool capacity was 150, every kid was in the pool. Yep. <laughs> you know, they didn't care. They thought it was great. Like for us, it was always the mini sticks in the hallway. Yep. How long could we play before somebody called security? Well, you know, for all the noise that that was the tough part, because a lot of the kids on my son's baseball team are also hockey players. So I was like, are we bringing the mini sticks? Like, come on, yeah. I, I want to play. And um, but we were playing in Rochester, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is. And people come to the Mayo Clinic from around the world for life saving treatments. And they don't always stay okay. at the hospital. So they'll stay at hotels. And we happen mm -hmm. to be staying at one of those hotels. So it's like, well, no, we can't be playing mini six in the hallway. We need to be quiet and quiet, respectful yep. of the other people that are here. Um, and they're, the kids, not just ours, but all the kids in the term were really good about that, with, except for the yep. ones in the pool. But that was away from the room, so that was okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, they, they needed their, uh, their escape somewhere. So the next for question sure. is, what's the best chirp you've heard directed at you, not directed at you, on the ice? In the That's locker true. room. <laughs> I don't like, hmm. I would have to. 
I know one of my instructors, he uses a chirp to the kids or that he's kind of told to a couple of kids. He's like, he always says, I've had, I've heard better chirps from a dead bird. <laughs> and the kids look at him like they take a second and they realize what he's trying to say. And yeah. uh, <laughs> that's pretty good. It gets the kids going for sure. Yep. Um, there's some of my kids that I like to tease a little bit about uh, the sunburn on the back of the neck because the yep. low light goes off so much, stuff like that. Oh, I'm trying to think back to when I played. What yeah. was a good one? David Hutchins of In Goal Magazine said one of his uh, kids' goalie coaches looked at him and said, you must be really good at dodgeball. Oh, that's a good one too. <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly can't think of any from when I played. That's That's the worst. Yeah, you know, it's funny when, when I think of the chirps from when I play it, I, I can't think of many either. I just remember yeah. some good one liners and comebacks, but not yep. necessarily chirps at other players or teams. Exactly. Yeah. It, and it was always good, like, especially my last couple of years of playing, like, I had big defense. You mm -hmm. know, the guys aren't going to stick around when you got a big D in front of you that push them out of the way or, or they don't have much time to really chirp at you. So, yep. Yeah. I, in the beer leagues there was one guy he was just going after me all game and he was getting under my skin and I think he was trying to pick fight he goes what you want to fight and I just looked at him and he said no I gotta work in the morning yeah <laughs> and the, the ref just started laughing and this guy just kind of looked at me like you make a good point but that yeah. just kind of took all the wind out of my sails of trying to upset you yeah <laughs> yeah uh so what is the worst post-game beer you've had Worst post game beer. Uh, I'd have to say, like, you get all ready for a beer and somebody hands out like one of these craft beers that is overly hoppy. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't tell you a name of one off the top of my head, but for me, I, like, I want something cold and refreshing, not something that I have to like force down after a game. Yeah. You nothing know, worse than that. I, I've said I'm, I don't drink Coors Light on the regular, but I almost think that's one of the perfect post-game beers because it's cool. Well, at least if, when they bring them in the cooler, they're cool yep. and they're refreshing and they just, they hit that spot right after a hockey game. Yep. Um, you know, like at home in the summertime, that's where I'll go with the, the hoppy beers, but yep. after a game, no, just, just need something. something cold and it's something that's smooth and goes down yeah, real you know, nice. Not the cheapest of beers. Don't bring any of that Bush Light or Natty Light nope. to the game, but a good Coors Light, Mick Golden Light, that's almost like the perfect post-game beer, in my opinion. Yep. Um, so when you tape your stick, you go heel to toe or toe to heel? Heel to toe. Okay. I, I, I like asking that question because every so often I get that one goalie who goes toe to heel. Heck, one previous guest said those goalies are psychopaths. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I always ask, you know, why do they go toe to heel? And most of them like to play the puck an awful lot. And they feel that going toe to heel helps the puck come off the toe better or the blade really? better. I'm not that good at playing the puck. So I don't have to worry about that. I've always done heel to toe. And I, I don't even, I'm curious to know if it would make a difference. Yeah. I, Connor Beaupre uh, was the first one to really give a good explanation. Um, but like I told him, uh, I'm not playing the puck enough for it to matter. And when I do, <laughs> I'm lucky if I know where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what is your favorite number to wear and why? Uh, so I've always wore number one. Okay. Uh, and the reason is uh, my dad's favorite goalie was Johnny Bauer. Oh. So I've kind of, kind of stuck with that. And I still, to this day, always wear number one. Okay. Good, good answer there. Not, not too many Johnny Bauer references on the podcast. Yep. I like it. Um, yeah, I was, I was lucky to have probably, I was probably about 1920. I was able to have lunch with Johnny Bauer. So I was, it was an awesome conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was telling stories. The one thing I'll never forget is the size of his hands. When you shook his hand, I honestly, like, I thought he was going to crush it. <laughs> like, just the size of his hands, was unreal. And it, you know, the stories, it, it was it was an awesome memory that I, I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. So, that, yeah, that, that, 
that's awesome. You know, and it was funny, I was talking to one goalie and they, they, they didn't like the number one for goalies. They didn't know where it came from. And I explained to him that, you know, back in the days of the original six, you know, the good players typically had single digit numbers because the sleeping berths on the train cars were assigned by your number and the lower the number, the bigger the bed on the, on the train. And so they always want, you know, the good players wanted the bigger bed. So that that's why, you know, goalies were typically number one and, you know, one through 10 were the biggest bed. So that that's yeah. why those single digits are retired, you know, for the most part by the original six teams. Uh, so my, my last question is what advice do you have for young goaltenders? For me, like even when I talk to my students, it's enjoy playing it. it if you're not enjoying, you're not having fun. There's a problem. in in my opinion, like, even when I train, even my elite kids, if you don't have a smile on your face, it, there's something, something's not right. Mm -hmm. uh, like, even when I played, like, I, I was hard on myself. I worked as hard as I could all the time, but I enjoyed being out on the ice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, there are some, some goalies that they are, were put there because they thought they had a better chance of making a team, mm -hmm. you know, maybe their heart's not in it a hundred percent. Um, but for me, it, you got to have fun. Yep. Enjoy being on the ice every time you step on the ice. Yeah. You know, the old Badger Bob, it's a great day for hockey. Um, and w when I was in college, I'd be walking out to the rink saying that to my teammates and they're like, give it a rest. You say it every day. I was like, cause every day it is a great day for hockey. Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I just, to this day, I still love being out on the ice. It's, it's almost, uh, it's like therapy to me. I'm the same. I yeah. could be out on the ice, whether it's coaching, playing, yep, uh, just being at the rink in general. I, I, I feel the most comfortable being at the rink and I enjoy it the most. Yeah. There, there's just something about walking into a rink, taking that deep breath of that cool air. Yep. That and, first step. Yeah. And it's just like, there it's almost like walking through those doors all of that anxiety and everything else just stops Goes right away there. Yep. and then of course when you walk out it hits you right back in the face but when, yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> once you're in the rink you're good for for those uh few hours for sure yeah well dan where can folks find you on social media if they uh, want to follow forest goaltending yeah so just uh at forest.goaltending on instagram uh it's probably the best place uh that's where we post all our content uh we'll be posting some new stuff from our camp last week uh, i know we're working on that we do contests um but yeah it's definitely the easiest place to find us and i'll be sure to put a uh, link to that and the website on in the show notes so people, perfect people that are uh lazy can easily find you. <laughs> yep. Um, but I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk to me. I, I've had fun getting to know you a little bit better. Uh, it, as I've said, with almost all of my guests, you know, by the time I'm done uh, with an episode, I, I feel like I've made another friend in goaltending where if we're in the same town, I, I know we're getting together for, you know, lunch or a drink and uh, just continuing the conversation. I, I think this is no different. Absolutely. If you're ever in Cambridge, Ontario, let yeah. me know. Or or your travels bring you through the Twin Cities. Yeah, for sure. You <laughs> yeah. never know. Yeah, you know, you, you might just have to come down for the Let's Play Hockey Expo and, you know, check everything out all at once. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, Dan, it's been a pleasure and uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I always find it insightful talking to goalie coaches to know what they find most important to the foundations of teaching young goaltenders. More and more of the conversation seems to be leading toward the mental side of the game more than the technical on-ice side of the game and finding a good balance along the way. Be sure to follow Dan on Instagram at Forest Goaltending and find him on Facebook at Forest Goaltending Professional Training and Skill Development. You can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube simply by searching for Wash Up Goalie and I'll pop up. Visit washupgoalie.com for some great hockey-related content, 
my beer league hockey video highlights, which should become much more regular now that the Minnesota Wild Adult Hockey League started this week with a big 7-6 to six come from behind win. No thanks to me. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, all podcast episodes. If you want some wash-up goalie or tendy talk apparel, be sure to visit my Threadless shop by clicking on the merchandise link of my website. If you like this podcast, go listen to the BLPA Big Show. It's the OG BLPA Podcast Network show where a couple of beer league players talk beer league hockey, draft experience shenanigans, and exploits from around the game. The show is hosted by Nick Jones and previous Sunday Talk guest Trish Dangle. Be sure to check out the full lineup of hockey-related podcasts on the Hockey Podcast Network as well. There are too many to list here, but shows like the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, the What a Hockey podcast, and the newest podcast on the network, the Hockey Hotbed, are all available. I need to thank the band The Zambonis for allowing me to use their music on my podcast. You can download their music at iTunes or wherever you stream your music from. I'm working on lining up other goalies to talk to. If you are a goalie or have connections to a goalie who I should talk to, shoot me an email at washedupgoalie39 at gmail.com or send me a DM on social media. And let's not forget, if you are a brand who wants to sponsor the show, be sure to reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk. And finally, if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment on the podcast platform you're listening on. It's a quick action on your part that helps others find Tendy Talk. So until next time... Keep your stick on the ice and your body square to the puck. Get on the train, it takes me away. Not gonna see you for a while. Why? It's an away game. It's an away game. I'm coming home soon. Just us two, just us two, just us two.